Good evening and welcome everybody. I am Dr. Stan Eckberg and I'm excited to have you here. We're going to talk about User Manual for Humans Part 3. And today is the first and there will possibly be some more talks on Food for Humans. So I call it Food for Humans so that it's kind of a little funny but we, we want to start thinking about, about humans. How many people here realize that you are an animal? Hands up. Okay. So basically, if you're not an animal, then you must be either mineral or plant. And we, we tend to forget that we are humans and that we are animals. And that's why I phrase it that way. That we're part of nature, we're part of biology. And the food that we eat, therefore, also has to be fitting for us. So when we talk about food, there's two aspects of it, and most people focus only on the physical matter of food. They talk about the components and what the food can do for us in terms of fuel and what the food can do for us in terms of building blocks. And the building blocks are protein and carbohydrates and fat, and then there's some minerals and, and vitamins as catalysts. And it's well enough if we put it into the body but there's also the other aspect of food is the act of incorporation. We have to bring it into the body somehow. And there's several steps involved there. And the first is mastication, that's chewing. We have to start preparing, we have to make smaller pieces of the food so our bodies can start using it. The second part is digestion, where we continue to break the food apart. Uh, and then we start attacking it and making it smaller and smaller pieces with secretions of digestive enzymes and then we move it around with peristalsis. That's the movement of the intestines that move the food forward and, and kind of churn it around. And once all that is done, we have to absorb the food. And after that, we have chemical processes of building things up called anabolism. And that's simply another word for, for building up. And then whatever part of the food that we can't use, we have to get rid of and excrete. And if we don't excrete it properly, then we get toxic. So excretion is also a, the first form of, of detoxification. So we want to talk about everybody here knows that you're supposed to eat more vegetables and you're supposed to eat less sugar and don't drink too many beers. Everybody knows that, but what we want to focus on are the whys. We want to ask the question, why don't we want to do that or do we want to do that? What is the process in the body? What happens when we eat certain foods? So, next, we, we put food into our mouths and then it enters the digestive tract. So what is the digestive tract? And the simplest way of looking at it is that it's a long tube. It has a hole in one end and it has a hole in the other end. That's what the digestive system is. And it's important to understand that because just because you've put something in your mouth does not strictly mean that it is inside your body. And when I say that, I mean that the functional tissue of your body is inside the cell. The machinery and the decisions and all of the regeneration and the DNA, everything that, that has, is part of that complex machinery is inside the cells. And unless we can get the foodstuffs inside the cell, it's not really going to do anything. So we put the food in one end of the tube and it comes out the other end of the tube. And whatever we extract of the food to make use of is an active process. And that's very important to understand because if we don't have that active process, if that active process isn't working properly, then we're not going to absorb a whole lot of nutrients. Theoretically, it's possible to put things in one end and have every piece of useful thing come out the other end and eating was basically useless. What we also need to understand is we've talked a lot about sympathetic and parasympathetic where the stress fires off the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system handles the processes of digestion. So what this means is when we are in a state of stress, 
we are sacrificing our parasympathetic nervous system and we are not able to absorb very much nutrients from the food. So you can be stressed and eat the perfect diet and not absorb very much useful nutrients. So that's crucial to understand because everybody talks about, oh, eat this, eat this, eat this. Nobody talks about take a five minute siesta, take a five minute breathing session, relax before, during, and after your meal so you can actually use the food. Weight gain. There is, uh, we're going to touch very, very quickly on a few misconceptions uh, and we're open to questions and then we're going to expand on them in, in future sessions. But weight gain is when your food is absorbed faster than it's used. So it's not so much how much or the quantity of food or calories that you eat that will make you gain weight, but there needs to be a balance between how quickly the food enters your bloodstream relative to how quickly your body will use it. So any excess portion, anything that you absorb faster than you burn, the excess has to be stored. And the human body is very limited in storing energy. It can basically do it in two forms. And one is as glycogen, that's a carbohydrate storage in the muscles and the liver. But you can only store maybe 100 to 200 grams. That's about four, five, six, seven hundred calories worth. Anything more than that, you have to store as fat. Your body has no other way of doing it. So the excess typically gets converted to fat. And you have an unlimited ability to store fat. You can store a couple of million calories of fats very, very easily. But only a few hundred calories of carbohydrates. And that's why the excess so quickly gets turned into fat. Also, we must, we must understand that the only thing that can store fat on your body, the only thing that can store energy is called insulin. Insulin is a hormone that takes sugar from the blood and takes it out of the blood and into the cells. So without insulin, you cannot store anything. And that means unless you trigger an insulin response, you cannot have a fat gain. So weight gain is caused by foods that trigger insulin. And which ones are those? They're anything that raises blood sugar, anything that gets absorbed into the bloodstream quickly, and this is primarily sugar, starch, and alcohol. So anytime that we eat those three, we jack up our blood sugar very quickly. Anytime we stay away from those three, we're going to have a much more level blood sugar. So weight gain is not caused by the number of calories. It's caused by how quickly those calories are absorbed. And therefore, weight gain is not caused by eating fat. Because fat and protein do not trigger an insulin response. They're absorbed so slowly into the body that you do not evoke an insulin response and therefore those two foodstuffs fat and protein are not very much responsible for weight gain. I have to read, when I, I looked for a food pyramid and I found this article on the champion of champion breakfasts. And breakfast number one, skim milk, half a banana, one serving of oatmeal with no calorie butter spray, Splenda and a dash of cinnamon. So right away we have skim milk. We've taken away the fat that gives us a, a sense of satiety. We're talking about pasteurized milk, probably, uh, which is very, very unsuitable for human consumption. Half a banana is a sugary fruit that will raise your blood sugar. Uh, one serving of oatmeal will raise your blood sugar. Uh, Splenda is a pesticide. So you're eating all this processed altered food that is no good for humans, that jack up the blood sugar, and then you dash some pesticides on it. And this is, in, in most people's eyes, a very suitable and, and healthy, good diet breakfast. Breakfast number two, two egg whites plus one egg yolk and 
an egg yolk and a dash of skim milk. Um, scramble no calorie cooking spray. Uh, add a have a cup of skim milk and a slice of whole grain bread with no calorie butter. So all the way through, they're talking about take away everything that gives you satiety. Take away all the fat that makes you feel full, and instead. Everything that they suggest is low-fat, altered milk, and grains, all of which will raise your blood sugar and get converted into fat. So it doesn't matter how much or little fat you eat, your body is going to make what it needs, and the more carbs that you eat, the more fat you're going to make. The food pyramid. Um, the classic view is at the bottom is the foundation. We have bread, we have pasta, we have grains, cereals, and so forth. And they're telling us to eat 6 to 11 servings per day of this stuff. And the more that you study this stuff and the more you talk to people who really know, they're going to tell you this stuff, if you eat that way, it will give you diabetes and it will give you heart disease. So not only is it not good for you, it will actually create diseases eating that way. Uh, it says two to four fruit, servings of fruits, three to five servings of vegetables, and then you get uh, meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, two to three servings, milk, yogurt, and cheese, two to three servings, and then at the top, fats, oils, and sweets enjoy sparingly. So let's take, let's take a look at that on the next slide, and let's see what those food nutrients, what, what are they good for, what do they do for us? So fat is one of the most important fuels that we have because it's a high quality fuel that is absorbed very slowly, it sustains blood sugar, and it's a very, very healthy way of, of getting your, your fuel. Uh, fat also acts as energy reserves, that's how the body stores them. Fat is uh, a major component of your hormone system. So cholesterol and quality essential fatty acids are very, very important for your hormone, for your endocrine system. Fat is also structural. It acts as insulation, uh, it, uh, both for, for uh, thermal insulation and electrical insulation for the nerves. So fat has a whole lot of different functions, and some of them are, are unique to fat. We cannot do without it, and that's why they have something called essential fatty acids. Protein. Protein also has a bunch of different functions. It can act as fuel. It can act as reserves. Uh, half or more of the, of the hormones in the body are called peptides. That's a, a subclass of, of hormones. Uh, and pro proteins are also structural because your muscles and all your contractile tissue is made of protein entirely. So protein and fat both have very uh, important and widespread and unique functions that you cannot replace with anything else. Carbohydrate, on the other hand, is fuel only. That's the only thing that carbohydrate is good for. So in terms of survivability and essential food stuff, you can do fine without carbohydrates. You can live a long, long healthy life with virtually no carbohydrates, but you cannot survive without fat and protein. So in terms of importance, just looking at that, uh, fat and protein are very important, carbohydrate not very important. And yet, in the food pyramid, they say, Fats and oils enjoy sparingly. And for some reason, as if there was something bad about them, they put fats and oils and sweet in the same group, as if they were related. They have nothing to do with each other. And sweets, yes, those are processed carbohydrates. You need to stay away from them. But fats and oils, in a natural form, the way they occur in nature, is maybe our most important nutrient. So, food pyramid, forget all about it. And next is the cartoon. There's this kid who's giving his report, and he says, the four basic food groups are stuff that will make me fat, stuff that will make me sick, 
stuff that will kill me and stuff that I'll eat anyway. So that's kind of how people feel about food, that there's been books written about why you can't eat every single kind of food out there. <laughs> so what, what do you eat? I mean, everything is bad, right? The, the, they've told us for, for decades that meat is bad, red meat is bad, and fish is bad, it's got heavy metals, and sugar is bad, and fat is bad, and, and this and that is bad. So let's just forget all about that and start talking about what food really is and what good food really is. So good food is food that contains fuel and nutrients for energy and building blocks that can be converted to human tissue. And think about that because this nail was food a month ago. This piece of skin was carrot or egg or spinach or something last month. So the whole purpose of food is to provide building blocks and to provide the stuff that can sustain the body and give it fuel and materials for regeneration. Next, good food is food that is recognized by your enzymes and receptors. So if you put something in your body that the receptors and the enzymes doesn't know what to do with, it doesn't have a good uh, key or puzzle piece fit, then your body won't know what to do with that. So when we take a natural food that has those proper pieces and we change it, then the body doesn't recognize it anymore. It's not a proper food. A good food is food that will not wreak havoc with your physiology and hormone balance. So primarily, again, we're talking about insulin. Uh, sugars, starches, and alcohols will mess severely with your blood sugar balance and therefore with your insulin, which is one of the foundation key, key factors in your, in your endocrine system. And good food is food that your DNA recognizes. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this, that ultimately, Everything that you put into your body has to be broken down into smaller pieces and those smaller pieces have to be able to cooperate and fit and mingle with digestive enzymes and with your body tissues. So your body has developed over tens of thousands of years and all the physiological processes and all the molecules have developed a certain fit over time and it has done that because nature has provided a certain kind of food. And that's how it is with every animal in, in nature. They are adapted over eons to their environment. So whatever it occurs in nature are things that fit your body, that you're supposed to have. And it can't be any other way because then we wouldn't be here. So when we talk about history, when we talk about uh, DNA, we need to realize that the DNA of hum Homo sapiens is virtually unchanged for the last 40,000 years. Uh, there's been a mass of articles in the literature, in physiology literatures, uh, that state this fact. And they all agree, for 40,000 years our DNA has not significantly changed. So when we think about that, that means any food that's introduced in the last 40,000 years is new to the body. It doesn't recognize it. And any food that has been changed is not recognized by the body. So we look at this, at this diagram here of historical adaptation. So if we have a timeline of 40,000 years, that's a long, long time, 40,000 years. This is the period of time that we have lived on Earth, and for most of that, or, or since our DNA changed last. And during that time, we have mostly eaten off what the land provides. We have been what's called hunters and gatherers. And so those types of foods agree very well. Your body knows what to do with them, and it can, it can function in a stable manner on those foods. Then, 
we look at the most, not the most recent, but the, the major significant event in human history is called agriculture. And it occurred about four or five thousand years ago, give or take. And when you look at it in perspective to the total range of, of time that we're talking about, the 40,000 years, it is still a blink. It is still a very, very short time. 4,000 years is nothing when it comes to, to evolving DNA. So even though the Egyptians started agriculture, and that seems like a really long time ago, it's not very long, because we have the same physiology they have. Now, let's look at the time period that we have had processed food and grains, processed grains. That's about 150 years. So for the last 150 years or so, we've had uh, quite a bit of processed foods, but it still hasn't been dominating our food supply. And then for the last 50 years, and the last, even the last 20, and that's such a short time, that if I was to write it proportionately, it'd be so thin that you couldn't even see it. And that's when the dominance the majority of our food supply has been severely processed and altered and there's an abundance of sugars and starches and not to mention all the additives in food. So frankly our bodies, our DNA has absolutely no idea what to do with that food and it has become most of the food that we eat. And that's why we are in, in such a bad state as, as we are. So think about this. What what do the other animals on Earth eat? The, basically, they eat anything that they can catch, pick, or gather. So all of those are foods that are purely produced by the planet, by Mother Earth. And they eat anything that is or was recently part of a living and breathing ecosystem here on the planet. So if we look at food in that perspective, we can see the stark contrast between that and anything that we pick up in, in the grocery store. So what do we want to feed Homo sapiens? Well, first off, we want to have a good protein source. Uh, we want to eat meat, fish, fowl, any sort of, of animal that runs around. But we want to eat the animals that have had a natural life and that have been fed and, and eating uh, things that are natural for them. So most of the beef, or all of the beef that you buy in the store is corn fed. And corn is not a natural food for a cow. A cow would never select corn to eat if you give him a choice. But in those food raising plants, they don't have a choice. So they eat the corn and they get really sick and they need medication and chemicals to, to tolerate it. So that makes a, a beef, a, a food, that just not very suitable. It's not a quality food. Uh, then we want to eat nuts and fruits and berries. And we want to eat them in the form that nature produces them. One of my favorite pet peeves is whenever they say made from. Because whenever they say made from, whatever it is, if it's made from apples, well, if it's not an apple anymore, it's not an apple anymore. So when you make something from something, it's totally irrelevant. When you mess with it, it's not what it used to be, and it can't provide the nutrients and participate in your ecology the way that it did before. And we want to eat vegetables and roots, like carrots and potatoes and different things. And we want to eat very limited whole grains. We can eat some, we can tolerate a, a little bit, but we're not really made to eat a lot of grains. So let's just give an example of that. Uh, let's talk about wheat. There's an epidemic of wheat intolerance and celiac disease. And, and what could that be, where could that be from? Well, let's look historically. 10,000 years ago and, and the time period we're looking back here, our ancestors probably ate some wheat, but the, they had two kinds of wheat. They were called emmer and einkorn, and they had 40% protein. 
Then 9,000 years ago there was a natural hybrid and we had a third kind of wheat called triticum something. And that was all the time, that was three weeds all the way up to modern times. And today, and in the last few decades, it has exploded into 25,000 types of wheat. And they have, that's happened with hybridization by mixing species, but more disturbingly, it's happening with genetic manipulation. So they go in and they, through manipulation, they insert and extract genetic traits and genetic code from these foodstuffs. And we don't really know how they're going to interact with our body long term because they've never been part of the food chain. It is not a natural food anymore. And if you look at one thing, the, the, the traits that they try to develop is not flavor or nutrition, it is resistance to weather and pesticides. Those are the basic things that they're interested in developing. And in doing this, they're changing important characteristics of the food. It's not the same food anymore. It doesn't have a natural genetic makeup. And one example we can talk about is the protein. It used to be, back here, it was 40% protein. Today, normal wheat, the average wheat, has 12% protein. So it's just not something that comes from nature anymore. Uh, and of course, the fast food industry, the next cartoon here. Our challenge is to convince the public that heart attacks are sexy. <coughs> if they can just do that, then, well, they're, they're pretty close. They're pretty close. <laughs> so when we talk about food priorities, there's so many different things to keep track of. What, what do we do? Where do we start? Well. The first thing that I want to recommend, and these are my opinions, I would say balance blood sugar. If you're just going to do one thing with your, with your food choices, you want to balance blood sugar. That means you lower sugar, starch, and alcohol, and you get good quality vegetables, protein, and fat. <coughs> Secondly, you want to eat more whole foods, more live foods, and more raw foods. That's the way all other animals eat them. That's the way they occur in nature. That's the way they fit the best into your biology. Uh, that means you eat less packaged, less processed, and definitely less additives and chemicals as well. Thirdly, if you want to start getting a little more picky, then you want to start trying to balance your pH. And that means you want to try to get it in the alkaline direction because most people today are very, very acidic that most of the things we eat, such as grain and protein and processed foods, are very acidic. The alkaline foods are going to be fruits and vegetables and anything that is naturally water-rich. And then, lastly, uh, you want to start trying to reduce the poison uh, and increase the nutrient concentration. You want to try to raise the quality of the food that you eat. And that means you want to start looking for organic food, you want to start looking for free range and local and sustainable foods. And what this does is the poison obviously doesn't belong in your body, it interferes with your bio biological processes. And also, when you feed a plant or an animal or a vegetable or a berry, uh, if you feed it artificial nutrients, then it basically gets bloated and big and pretty, but it doesn't have much nutrient content in it. So when you eat organic and local and sustainable, then you're increasing your nutrient concentration as well as reducing the, the poison. So let's real quick go over and talk about what's required to maintain health. So what would you say if you're trying to raise a plant and the plant isn't doing too well, what, what's the first thing that you're going to give it? Water. Water, okay. So now you're, you're feeding it, you're watering your plant, but it's still not doing very well. What's the next thing that you would think of? <clears throat> Appropriate sunlight. Sunlight, exactly. So now you're giving it water and sunlight, and it's still not very happy. What, what are you thinking? 
Soil, exactly. Because plants need three things. You can ask a five-year-old, so I'm not trying to make you look bad here. A uh, five-year-old will know that you got to put the plant in the soil and you have to give it water and you have to give it sunlight. So for the life form called plants, those elements are required. How many times, if you try a million times to raise a plant and you give it two out of three? You plant, put it in the soil, but you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm just going to give it sunlight, no water. How many healthy plants are you going to have? Zero. Zero. Cactus. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it doesn't matter which ingredient we remove. If something is required, we cannot get a, a healthy plant long term with, with two out of three. And the same thing holds true for humans. So what do humans need? Humans have nutritional needs. We have structural, physical movement needs. And we have emotional needs. So what this means is we need to eat well, we need to move well, we need to think well. And eating well, we've talked about what that means. You eat real food and less poison. Moving well means just what it sounds like. We need exercise. We need to move. Our physical apparatus is designed for movement. It does not function without movement. And if you try to withhold movement for any length of time, the body degenerates. The whole system, every aspect, muscular, neurological, everything degenerates. And think well, that means we have to feel good, we have to have a purpose, we have to have most of our thoughts, or at least some of our thoughts, need to be positive and hopeful. If we're always feeling bad, if we're always depressed and or stressed, then our bodies break down as well. So these are requirements of humans. Eat well, move well, think well. And of course, movement, if you have a body, if you have a spine and a body that where the joint range of motion isn't what it should be, then exercise is not going to go all the way. Exercise will help, but it will only be partially beneficial because if the joints aren't moving, that's, that's a bottleneck. That's a limitation in the function and communication of the body. The signals cannot uh, develop and be generated the way that they should. And that's a different seminar. We'll take a whole, a whole seminar on, on that part alone. Um, so overall, that, that concludes what we have to talk about for tonight. We try to keep it simple and brief. And uh, lastly, we would like you to think about anyone that you know who would like to feel better. I think that should be 99% of the population that can benefit from, because most of them never got a user manual, and we're trying to compile one piece by piece here for you. So we want to thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take some questions at this point.